During the pandemic, schools were tasked with building the plane while they were flying it. How to get teachers and students up to speed with remote learning and technology. Today, on Education Spotlight, we'll talk about what's new in education for the classroom and innovations that could significantly alter the way schools operate. Stay with us. Welcome to the Santa Cruz Community TV's Education Spotlight. I'm David Warren. I'm a retired Cabrillo College teacher and an SCC TV board member. Today, we are pleased to be speaking with Jason Borgen. Jason is the Chief Technology and Innovations Officer at Santa Cruz County Office of Education. Jason's responsibilities are vast, involving cutting edge digital technology, internet communications and learning innovations for teachers and students throughout the county. We are also joined by my good friend and fellow board member, Keith Kuja. Jason, it is a pleasure to be speaking with you today. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here uh, supporting and uh, sharing out to community television uh, board members and listeners and watchers. Okay, Jason, you have an impressive array of duties and responsibilities at a time of great stress from COVID. Have I described your role adequately and how are you and your staff coping with these challenges? You, you, you bet. I mean, there, there's not kind of one thing I was not involved with during the, during the pandemic. And obviously just like students had a pivot, we had a pivot in our roles as, as educators. Um, and the ability for us as administrators even to sh change the way we do business and we support um, our clients, which in, this, in fact our teachers, parents, families, as well as the students ultimately to ensure they received uh, a quality education during the pandemic. Uh, one thing I can say for sure though, the great thing is our students are back on campus this year and it's been great to have them back. And you can feel the excitement in the air, the, the natural, um, playfulness students and adolescents and children have uh, towards each other to their peers and just learning in general. So that's the great news is have seen students being back in action. Obviously it was a it was quite a year and that year always has shifted how we do business today. Um, and really what we're trying to focus on is building students uh, wellness and their ability to uh, enact and, and interact with their peers, their teachers, even their families. And so obviously, if you look at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, obviously safety and, and, and quality of, of life is kind of at the foundation before you can even talk about learning and other uh, traits or skills. And so we're really focusing on students' wellness and health, mental health first and primarily uh, to support the learning secondarily. Um, and you'll see this kind of pop up all over the county uh, with wellness centers starting to pop up, uh, counselors talking to students and the ability for uh, students just to feel uh, uh, successful in their in their day to day kind of uh, uh, tasks at hand to whether it be interacting with their classmates and or even just being able to walk to the bathroom by themselves. Right, we have first graders who haven't seen a classroom since preschool, and so this this year, so really teaching them the ability to interact uh, uh, more uh, independently. It's kind of some skills we're really trying to work with students on uh, primarily. Uh, and then obviously secondarily is to help the teachers use the great things they learn during the pandemic uh, with technology and, and leverage those skills specifically around uh, whether it be uh, using learning management systems such as Google Classroom, which basically went from uh, probably 10% of teachers using learning management systems across K-12 to 100% of teachers using learning management systems in 2020, 2021. And so that big shift is how do we continue the momentum and build upon that to really uh, take tech, the good things about technology to improve education and promote um, uh, more innovative practices in the classroom. Well, it's extraordinary what uh, you and students and teachers are, are going through at the moment. Um, how involved are you with the educational curriculum? Um, so most school districts um, are approve their own curricula uh, the for the different content areas. So that is all board approved uh, for each local education agency. Uh, we, and it's all recommended by the state board as well. So there's basically a bucket they would pull from a curated list typically. 
Um, we help support and advise on uh, alignment to their current plans, district's plans, uh, as well as, you know, what are some, some curriculum that's gonna be most engaging for students and relevant for today's student body and ultimately for a student's future careers. Um, but with, with that being said, we support the um, delivery of the curriculum through instructional models, right? So typically you look at a textbook, the old, in the old days, a textbook was the only thing teachers had to teach from, and that was all they taught from. The textbook was the curriculum. Nowadays, we like to think of the textbook as just one resource within the whole curriculum. So when we think about full, you know, current modern day curricula, we talk about resources, third party resources, open educational resources that are basically created by anybody out there in the world that have a, a expertise in a specific subject. They put it online and make it available for free for educators. So there is a whole process of actually evaluating those resources for quality, for credibility, for authority as well, which based, we work with teachers to develop a digital literacy mindset, ensuring they uh, review material and ensure its credibility. We, we tell them to do that, what they call the crap test, which is looking at the credibility of the material, the reliability, the authenticity, and really the point of view and purpose of the author, why the author put this together in the first place. And so we always like to work with teachers and students and have them do the crap test for any online resource they find. Um, and that's kind of just a good, good mindset to have when you evaluate anything online, because now anybody can be an author on the web. Yeah. Uh, I was impressed on your website that you're working on uh, a, a media literacy uh, uh, effort. Uh, can you describe really what that's about and is it implemented at most levels? Yeah, so there's a couple of different components. I mean, thanks to a, a grant from Community Television, uh, we're working on teaching students and teachers on how to use video in the classroom successfully. So uh, Community Television received a grant for Padcaster kits, which are basically iPads, uh, lenses that go for the iPads, a boom microphone that go on the iPads, and a tripod. And uh, so it basically creates this kind of uh, uh, professional looking video production kit. And so we're working with teachers to train them on how to use video in the classroom for students to demonstrate their understanding of content through video. And so that includes uh, how to create videos, how to take uh, good video shots or angles, uh, how to put together videos, how to use uh, video editing tools from pre-production to storyboarding, uh, to production, to uh, camera angle, and of course to post-production, which is uh, editing using title slides, transitions, and uh, uh, just basic editing skills in video and using software accordingly. And so the part of that is too, is teaching these teachers on how to use easy or low cost or even free to use tools for video editing that are made to be collaborative. So students don't have to work in isolation on this video editing, where students can actually work with their peers and video edit in, in a, in, a bubble, in collaboration uh, together around their project. So not only does it teach the skills of video editing and media literacy, but also teaches them kind of ongoing problem solving and working working uh, together as in cooperative learning groups. That's great. And um, are students uh, finding this exciting? Yeah, I think, you know, one thing we're really trying to push is create an authentic audience. Uh, for students because students really do well and they're motivated if they have somebody to look at their work, right? Typically when we went to school, you know, we had, we created work, we had this teacher graded and went back to us and it was only us and our parents who got to see it. You know, now modern day uh, projects, you can create an authentic audience around the world. You can, and you know, obviously thank you to community television, they're gonna be showcasing some of these videos these students make, but really even just put it on YouTube, you can have students, their peers in Japan and China actually review the work the students did in the classroom. So creating this global awareness around what happens in US schools, in fact, in Santa Cruz County schools can go global because of this. I think that's, that's very, very exciting. I can, I can imagine uh, students really uh, getting excited about that. And hopefully they have an opportunity to interact with some of the students in other countries. Yeah, definitely. What we're trying to do is really promote transformative learning and teaching. And so there's actually a framework out there called SAMR, uh, which was developed by a researcher um, named Dr. Ruben Puentaderas. Um, SAMR uh, basically is how we integrate technology in the classroom. And the first level of technology integration is substitution, right? For example, a worksheet teacher has been working on for 20 years, they can use technology with that worksheet by making that a PDF and having the students type in on a digital 
keyboard. And so that's using technology, but it has no functional difference than just a plain printed out worksheet. So what's the purpose of truly using that technology versus the other end of the spectrum, which is um, a redefining use of technology. So that's actually doing something in your classroom that was not possible 20 years ago without technology. For example, having students collaborate with a, on a video and sharing it with the world. That was not possible 20 years ago. And so that's redefining how we use technology. That's the R in SAMR. So you go from substitution to redefinition. And we're helping teachers go from that one end of the spectrum to the other because substituting technology is that's not a real true use of, of having a tool in place to help you and engage students. Really what we want students to do or teachers to do is redefine learning and redefine outcomes through technology. And the global perspective is, is amazing unto itself. It, uh, it brings the world to you and you're able to take yourself to the world. And, yeah, absolutely. And um, I think one thing, you know, we saw last year is one thing that we saw is we saw about 0% of teachers or maybe 1% of teachers actually using video conferencing tools to 100% of teachers using video conferencing tools like Zoom, right? Um, and even students, I have a, I have a 10 year old and you know, during the pandemic, he was eight, nine uh, at home. He asked me to go make a calendar appointment for him in Google calendar, turn on his Zoom and help him uh, do, his, do his math homework on video. And so talking about these students, that's, that, I think that's a benefit of the pandemic. These students have acquired so many technology skills in a very short amount of time that they probably wouldn't have acquired uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a regular comprehensive classroom. Well, that, that brings up another question that, I, I, that I'm interested in, and that is uh, with so much experience of students uh, communicating from home and uh, teachers, uh, I, I'm, I'm enthralled with the idea that we see each other's home uh, in, in the background and so forth. Uh, but it, it's um, considering that the school or the home has become a learning place that has really changed. And um, it's, it, is it, is it, are we headed more in that direction of where the, the home is a, is a learning place unto itself? And that's, yeah, def, David, I, I think that question, it can be loaded because there's different perspectives on that. And again, you know, Really what our focus here at the County Office of Education is, is to support all students and really uh, uh, emphasis on equity. And so you go to one home where every student, they may have three students in that family, they all each have their own room where they can privately do their work and, and go on a computer. Where you go to another house somewhere else, they may have 25 people who live in two houses that they share back and forth and they're sharing a room with three or four or five different siblings or, or family members. And so is, is that experience for that one student who has one, their own room versus one student has to share five, a room with five students, the same experience educationally. And so we need to think foundationally, is that experience gonna be the same? And how do we make sure we provide a personalized experience that's gonna benefit both that student who has to share a room with five, uh, five children and that room where that student gets to be all by himself in a 15 by 15, uh, uh, a size room, 15 foot by 15 foot size room. And so foundationally, is it gonna be the same experience without anything? And with that being said, you know, we can easily answer that's probably not the same experience. Uh, you know, California has put strict laws against uh, virtual classrooms at home, uh, which is they said basically you cannot do it uh, in a comprehensive school, in K-12. And so the only way typically now schools, K-12 schools in California, uh, uh, comprehensive public schools can have virtual learning is through an independent study contract. So in students have to be put on uh, individualized independent study contracts, which you can't really scale to uh, you know, 5 million students statewide, obviously. Um, and so with that, there are districts in our county specifically that have individualized uh, independent study co contracts for specific students because of their needs those specific students needs. But what I think we're on to with the individual studies contract is every student has their own learning ways they learn and uh, learning needs. And so what this is leading us towards is this virtual school program might be good for this student, but not this student. So how do we identify and collect the data needed on the needs of that student and, and use that to make the determination what does their future schooling look like? And so with that, we started really focusing on data a lot at the County Office of Education 
And you can actually see our data portal. We put together a data portal uh, at dataportal.santacruzcoe.org that shows all the uh, elements of how we're collecting data and what we're looking at when we're looking at um, um, the effects of both academic data, mental health data, behavior data, um, college going rate data, and, and there's many other data points you'll see on our data portal as well uh, that we're looking at to drive some of these changes in planning uh, plannings in our county and, and each school district specifically. I was um, looking at that and, this, this morning and I was very, very impressed and especially impressed about the wellness aspects of it. And uh, it's extraordinary. That's a, that's a monumental amount of effort you put into this. I know you've- Yeah, also, you know, we have a good team. No, go, yeah, ahead. go ahead. I was just gonna say, we, you know, we have a strong team that really focuses on it. And thank goodness our county superintendent, Dr. Parasava, really has a mindset towards using data to drive decisions. And so, and, and really the, with the emphasis on equity. So making sure the decisions being made are really focusing on the students who need the most support and help and really identifying that, making sure we move the ground up, not the middle up, but really move the ground up. Right. I, I uh, know that one of the aspects of the, the need to go to remote learning uh, takes away from the opportunity for students to socialize. Has, has this been, a, have, is there a major effort to fill in that gap? You know, there has been a lot of extra effort put onto that, uh, whether it be uh, more kind of downtime or, or free time for students, uh, kind of organic time for them to just play and be with one another. Um, you know, non-structure time, I think helps a lot with that. Uh, a lot of schools starting to move, or I've seen uh, over the years, move to what they call genius hour in the classroom or 20% time, you know, based upon Google's model of the 20% model Google has, where they allow all their employees at Google 20% of their time to work on something they're passionate about. And so how do we take that movement and put it in the classroom where students have unstructured time, where they spend 20% of their time or an hour a week on working on something with their peers of something that they're passionate about? It's not really structured around the content, but just focusing on their own passions. And so uh, that really kind of creates a self-worth for students and appreciation for education and the school system in general. Great. Um, the question here is what technology innovations could significantly alter the way schools operate? And then you've, you've, you've touched on some of these. Um, what yeah, so, so we took the opportunity to rethink education and adapt it to our changing world. It sounds like you're definitely involved in that with uh, reaching out to other countries, um, getting better connectivity in people's homes, etc. Yeah, you know, foundationally, obviously, you meant you, you talked earlier a little bit about you know is is the way our schools going to change to kind of at home learning, and I think there's always been at home learning, right? There's always been the idea of homework. And, you know, you have schoolwork and you have homework. And, you know, again, I don't like to think of them as separate things. I think I like to think of it as just learning period. You learn and learning should not just be a six hour a day thing. It should be ongoing. Students need to appreciate learning and true lifelong learning. So it's not at school work or homework. It's just learning. How can that happen at home? And there's, I think there's many ways to do that. Obviously, connecting students through mentors. And, and, and global peers and not just people in their classroom, the ability to have them connect. And there's lots of software that does this to global pen pals um, and systems like that where they can connect. And I think learning about other cultures is a foundation and a piece as far as um, what a good competency for them to be successful in their careers, knowing that they're probably gonna be in a position of somebody with a different cultural or ethnicity than themselves um, um, to learn about other cultures through these types of systems. Um, and they can do that anytime, anywhere, and hopefully some are. You know, our students are, I think, by nature, more self-directed now because they can get online easily and look at content easily with their fingertips. They don't need a content expert anymore to give them the content. The content is at their fingertips. They need somebody to help them learn and organize those thoughts into acquisition of content, not just the content itself. And so as we shift, I think there's gonna be lots of opportunities to leverage multiple modes of learning um, I see we're seeing XR take a lot, a big shift into education space. Um, XR is basically, you know, could be virtual reality or augmented reality. And how do we tie that into learning? You know, for example, uh, instead of 
um, looking at a textbook and just looking at a picture of a heart. You can actually take a, a device, hover it over the heart, and the heart comes alive and actually beats in front of you in 3D. You know, that's augmented reality. And that really makes it a little bit more enhanced than just a piece, uh, a two-dimensional heart on, on, in, a, in a book. Um, so we're seeing much more of that come to, come to fruition as well. Um, um, and then, you know, VR, immersing yourself in an actual lecture lab from a real professor or in the, you know, in the pyramids in Egypt putting on some goggles and it's truly immersive. You're actually in Egypt in the pyramids. Again, much more motivational just watching a video about the pyramids. Well, well you opened up a lot of room here, uh, especially thinking of, I was just uh, listening to a program on NPR about uh, the metaverse and <laughs> I won't go there, but um, the one thing I, I do wonder about is um, how students distinguish between what is real and fake on the internet. Yeah, and, that, and you alluded to this earlier about, we didn't I really go into depth about the media literacy piece. You know, and this is all embedded into media literacy or what sometimes we call digital literacy. Um, and, you know, I like to think of it as just literacy nowadays, right? Because you need to be able to be able to speak, communicate and interact on the computer using technology anytime, anywhere. So it's not separate anymore. Um, and, and the idea is, I kind of, I mentioned this earlier, the crap test, right? That's the kind of ultimate piece you put together, you know, making sure we always have that mindset, anything we look, look at it. What's the credibility of this author? What's the reliability? Does this author have any other, or what's the authority of this author? Do they have any other articles? Are they peer reviewed? You know, what's the point of view? Why is this author putting this together? So I always tell, you know, my students, my teachers I work with, my staff, that anytime you look at something online, you should be asking yourself those questions on every single page you go to. Um, and, and, and there are some resources to teach on that as well. Uh, I'm not sure if you've ever seen the Tree Octopus website, but that's our classic one we like to talk about, is there's a website about a tree octopus. And it's an octopus that lives in a tree, uh, Pacific Northwest Tree Octopus, actually. If you Google that, you'll find this whole article. It has a scientific name and everything. And you ask the students to use the crap method and evaluate, is this true or not? That's, that's really interesting. Um, well, in terms of uh, critical thinking and uh, the atmosphere at home and the directions for the future, uh, you've mentioned a number of these and uh, uh, how, how does it balance out looking into looking ahead? Yeah, you know, so what we're trying to do, we, we started this computer science initiative a couple of years ago, uh, partnering with Cabrillo College um, and Santa Cruz Works as well. Santa Cruz Works is a nonprofit bringing all high tech um, uh, employers, employees of these high tech companies locally together in a nonprofit association. And uh, what we're trying to do is bridge that gap, right? Where uh, our K-12 system is, is a powerful system but we're siloed in K-12. And community colleges are a really great system. They're doing a lot of things for career prep, but they're siloed in community college. And again, you look at industry, industry is doing great stuff, but they're somewhat siloed in an industry, you know, which we need to create that bridge from K-12 to community colleges, to universities, or into directly into the careers. And this initiative we started a couple of years ago, thanks to statewide monies, um, is to do exactly that, is to create this pathway from high school to community college into careers and making sure we have all um, representatives of those different groups on the table to decide what this looks like and what the next steps are. So we have a, a whole initiative. You can learn more at cs.santacruzcoe.org about how we're offering these high school courses completely aligned to Cabrillo College computer information system courses. Uh, we see that there's so many openings around computer science positions or IT positions in Santa Cruz County still. And they're saying that the growth of computer uh, uh, careers is going to basically double any other career in any industry in the next 10 years. And so there's going to be lots of openings in computer science or information technology positions for our current students in, uh, in Santa Cruz County. And so how do we create this bridge for them to help them be aware what's there and what's available at a young age. So we're doing everything from launching these Cabrillo College courses in the high school level. We have a pathway right now focused on cybersecurity. So students can actually earn up to 12 units of Cabrillo College credits before they even graduate high school um, and be on the pathway towards a cybersecurity analyst uh, at 18 years old. Um, and we're launching a separate piece, which is all around um, student help desk support. 
So we're actually launching student help desks in middle school and high school um, where they get to help their teachers fix their own technology um, at that level. And, and what does it mean to be a help desk technician at a middle, you know, and what does that career look like? Um, and then obviously bringing, uh, bringing industry into the schools. So thank you to, thanks to Santa Cruz Works and their efforts. They're bringing all these companies together to speak to students, to talk to students about what these careers look like at Looker, at Joby Aviation. You know, we're going to have these, uh, the future of aeronautics. You look at Joby's right in our backyard. Um, they're doing great things on, on, um, on um, ride sharing uh, in the air, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's completely revolutionary. And so how do we get our students prepared to work at these, these, these local locations? Because we want to keep our students in Santa Cruz County as much as we can. They're great people, they're great kids, they're going to be great adults, and they're going to be great for our workforce. So really our focus is preparing them and working with all of our partners uh, around this because it, it really takes a village to build our future, you know, our future generation uh, workforce here locally. Um, second thing we're trying to do is really build out on you know, the idea of evaluating students' skills in math, science, history is has been the same process for the last 250 years. And so we've been doing that for 250 years, evaluating students in the four core content areas. But is that truly the path of the future? Is that truly still relevant in today? Do all those subjects, are they individualized or does it all mesh together in one? And so, you know, we're looking at some other models uh, and where we've been trained by uh, this organization called the Next Generation Leadership. Um, Academy, which is based at University of Kentucky, uh, they developed a model called What Schools Could Be. And the What Schools Could Be Academy we went through last night, they focus on developing what they call a portrait of a graduate. And these portraits of a graduate are not based upon content areas, but they're based on competencies or skills. For example, uh, a critical thinker or um, uh, somebody who is a, um, a global communicator. And so you work, you focus on these competencies and that's the, you think, and then you backwards map from those competencies and what skills need to be involved or developed to build out those final competencies. And so how do we take those competencies and value, evaluate students on those competencies rather than those core content areas is something we're looking to as well. Well, Jason, thank you so much for spending this time with us and helping educate us on, you know, the, the incredible landscape of uh, education in our, in our uh, county. And uh, we look forward to having more interviews to, with the education folks and uh, moving on from here. Thank you so well, much. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate that. And uh, definitely it was an engaging conversation and, and definitely uh, hope we, you will continue willing to support us in education and looking forward to these future conversations. Great. Well, for the viewers out there, thank you so much for watching and uh, really appreciate uh, your attention to this.